at the end of the day, like that's what you try to do is position you, yourself as the person that if people decide to change their mind, you're the one they reach out to. That's pretty much, I mean, I went from like, oh, my goal is to be a millionaire to like, who cares about that goal? Uh, I would really say that to your listeners too. No one cares. You won't care, honestly, when you get there. What you will care about is, do you have passive income? Welcome back to Life Worth Chasing. I'm your host, Chase Maher, and this show is about helping entrepreneurs build their business around their dream lifestyle. My guest today is a financially free real estate investor who has flipped over 300 houses. He retired at age 31 with passive income from his paid off rentals, sold almost everything except the rentals, and traveled the world. He loves systems for food, fitness, business, and personal development. He's my friend and somebody that I truly admire how he handles business, how he handles his portfolio, and his overall financial mind. He is Jared Fielding. Jared, welcome to the show, man. Hey, good to chat with you, Chase. I'm really excited, man. You were just telling me how you know, you've been invited on podcasts before. This is the first one you did, and it really warmed my heart. I really appreciate that. You know, we met, I would say, probably two years ago. You actually came down to San Diego and took the room that I was living in when I moved out of the homie's house to uh, move in with my girlfriend. And we got to chatting and I'm like, man, this is one of the very few people that if I were to trade places and have his life when I'm his age, I wouldn't be too upset about it. There's not many of those in the world. So I wanted to let you know that before we get started. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was uh, awesome the way the timing on that worked out. Yeah, it was super cool, man. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because I, I don't like being that show where it's like, you know, take me through your entire childhood. But I would like to know a little bit, you know, where you're from, how you were raised and sort of when you got started real estate investing. Right. So I grew up in eastern Washington, which is kind of smaller town, kind of more rural. I was raised by two parents that were both farmers. So, you know, like a real sense of work ethic growing up. And I got into real estate when I was 19. I actually dropped out of college because I uh, realized I was learning. I was in business school and was learning how to make money from people that didn't actually make money. So one of the best insights I had was that uh, I actually wanted to learn from someone who was doing the thing that I wanted to do, not teaching about it, but was disconnected from it. Very cool. And so that was 19. And you know, like when you started rocking and rolling with real estate, actually, you know what? I want to ask you something. And Ben, a mutual friend of ours, told me about a story that I think kind of sums up how I know you as sort of a systems and like figure it out kind of guy. He told me a story that your dad locked you in a room when you were a kid with a computer that was all disassembled and told you to put it back together or something like that. What, what's going on there? That was, they didn't lock me in a room. For a, a Christmas present, uh, I was really into tech when I was young. In fact, my first business was buying computer parts, assembling them and selling them, you know, back when there wasn't like, back when that's actually how you really bought computers. So I got a, you know, instead of like, here's your computer kid, it was like, here's your, you know, computer toolkit. And here's the hard drive. Here's the motherboard. Here's the power case. Like, here's all the pieces. Good luck figuring it out. And it was, it was an amazing process because there's, you know, there's no, there's no YouTube back then. Like you literally just figured it out. That sense of like, you have no idea what you're doing, but you just kind of move forward until you succeed. Started like at a really young age. Very cool. How old were you at that time? I was probably 12 or 13. Locking you in the room makes the story sound even cooler, but we're going to. <laughs> it, does. it also makes me wonder if like CPS is going to knock on my dad's door. So yeah. I'm just being real clear about that. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me this, man. How many businesses or entrepreneurial type things did you get into before you started investing in real estate at 19? First business was computers. So I did a lot of put computers together and sell them to people. And then I would do kind of like tech support type stuff, you know, and I was making, you know, 30 to 60 an hour when you're, you know, a 12 year old kid back you know, it feels like hundred years ago. That's, that was a lot of money. Then I got into stock trading. Um, I actually used my college savings and trade with it and did really well and then lost money. And in the end, I just found that that was an approach that over a long period of time, I didn't know a lot of people that stayed in the game and made a lot of money. 
And when I was kind of looking at my wounds from a particular loss, I started thinking that most of the people that I knew that were wealthy were in real estate. I, I mean, I knew, you know, from family, I knew doctors and lawyers and, and just random people that were wealthy. And the one thing they all had in common was that their wealth came from, from real estate. So that, that, that was about how deep that analysis was. It wasn't like super analytics. It was really, at the end of the day, rich people seem to be in real estate. I'm going to go into real estate. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that it takes a genius to figure out, but what it is, is it takes somebody that's committed and willing to work hard to not only figure it out, but take action on it and move forward. And the fact that you dropped out of college at, at, at 19 to make that transition is, uh, is pretty cool. Did you have your parents support for that, uh, that vision? Yeah, I was really lucky that I did. I think that, you know, my mom was a school teacher. My dad was, you know, PhD. So they're very education oriented. And I felt like I was going to get a lot of pushback and didn't. They were very supportive. That was really fortunate that that phase of my life. I mean, that support has been, you know, different. I, I think my mom's a little less entrepreneur than my dad is. So there were parts where I think she, you know, it was a little more difficult for her to be supportive, but I've always had like really, I've always felt like I had a really supportive environment that way. The, the other thing I really like about real estate is I feel like unless you're some Zuckerberg or, you know, genius with tech, real estate's one of the few things you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be really successful at. And, and I, I've always felt like, you know, I'm smart, but I'm like, there's a lot of people a lot smarter than me. And real estate felt like, I mean, you start hanging out with stock traders and you're hanging out with brilliant people that get decimated in the stock market a lot. And it felt like real estate was something that I could do. And, you know, you make your money when you buy, which I really liked. So it felt like very safe and predictable for the most part. And something I had a lot of control over, which I didn't feel in the stock market. And again, I just felt like your average person with, with work ethic and some discipline can have extraordinary results versus about every other thing that I can think of. That's powerful. And I remember you and I, we were at coffee like maybe six months ago and we were talking about that exact topic. And I was telling you like different things that I had ideas about, different things I wanted to try out. And we kept coming back in the conversation to, you know, you could try all that and you could go down that path, but you're going to always come back to real estate. Why not just focus on real estate now? You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just got to know how to buy low, how to sell high. And that's about it. And that's what I used to do in the car business. And so every single time I hit a, uh, you know, a, a stopping point in anything I'm working on, I always come back to real estate and I'm like, why don't I just focus on this full time? And so that's what I've been doing since our conversation and, and things have been great. So let's talk about you for a second. What's your experience as an investor so the listeners can have an idea? I mean, I know that I talked about it a little bit in your intro about flipping houses and rentals, but tell me um, sort of at 19, you started kind of what happened over the next 10 or so years. Right. So uh, 19, I got my first house, worked really hard, kind of shook all the trees and, and just didn't give up. I really got to say, if there's one overarching thing that I could say, it's that I didn't get my first house for six months. And, and I was doing this like full time. So that is a really long time, especially when you're 19 years old, to work and get nothing in return. Were you looking for rentals or flip opportunities? For flips. For flips. Rentals didn't, didn't come in until uh, a bit later. I mean, initially, it was just the game was flipping for me. So yeah, I, I think that, again, the number one mistake I see people do is that they read too many books. Um, they get focused too much on learning by not doing. And the people that I've helped like transition into actually making money have been the ones that I'm like, yeah, read for, talk to people for, you know, like one to three months. And at the end of the day, really go after a property because that's when you really get into the nuts and bolts of what it takes. So got my first house, six months. Thank goodness I didn't give up at month four or five or five and a half. Bought the thing for like 40 grand. I mean, we put almost no money into it. I mean, we probably worked on it for a week hired somebody else to do all the work, flipped it, made, I think like 44, 42, something like that. An enormous amount of money for, uh, at that phase of my life, I mean, I was working 70, 80 hours a week on the farm, making $4,500 every summer. So that was like almost 10 years worth of summers working my tail off. And it was just, it was just so much money. And it was just, it was just like this, this rush of like, oh, I don't, I didn't want my time to connect with my money. 
that was another realization that working on the farm was for me. Like I can work 70 to 80 hours, but somewhere past 80, I can't work that much more than that and definitely can't have a life. And so I, I realized really young, I don't want what I get paid to connect to how much time I spent. And this was like a step, real good step and affirmation in that direction where it took a while to get, but, and then it snowballed, you know, second property came faster, third property came faster and easier. And how much time and energy I spend is very disconnected from how much money I make. I love that, man. Don't let time connect with your money. And you made that realization at such a young age. And I'm, I'm sure a lot that had to do with it was watching your parents work all those hours on the farm. And then you realizing that, hey, yeah, I just worked six months to find a deal. But my actual work, once I found it, made me all this money. Let's just do this again and I'll get better at it. And, and you know, how much more money can I make from there? And it looks like it really worked out for you. My first question for those first six months is what were you doing to find that deal and how did you actually find that deal? You know, right now the market has just a whole lot of people going into it, right? I mean, Philippines is very popular, market's just been crazy. But what I found is that the auction block was just difficult to get stuff at. And so, you know, I went and knocked on doors of people that were in foreclosure, talked to them, and it's just a function of numbers. I mean, at some point, um, this guy was like, you know, no, I don't want to sell it. We're good. We're good. And at the last minute, he's like, you know, I was renting it to family members and they were just really taking advantage of him. And he was just like, I'm out, you know, you give me a certain amount of money, you take over payments, I'm out. And that was it. And, and really it came down to, obviously other people were contacting him, but I was the person that was top of mind. That was the most consistent that was you know persistent but not annoying and and I, I was consistent with how I reached out and you know I had a certain tone and at the end of the day like that's what you try to do is position you, yourself as the person that if people decide to change their mind you're the one they reach out to got it that's important man I I feel like fortune is in the follow-up and it sounds like that's how you got your first deal Yep. hundred percent. So if you were to, uh, if somebody said, you know, Jared, what's your business model for flipping houses? You know, how do you fund them? What type of deals do you like to flip? Just real quick, because that's going to really help us into the next part of this conversation. So are you talking now or then? Let's talk now. Okay. So I'm not partnered with anybody. Like I own all the business businesses that are connected to what I do. So I have lines of credit at this stage. So the rentals that I have were paid off. Um, we'll take lines of credit against those. So a lot of people tend to, to like loans on their rentals. I tend to have like huge flows move in and out. So I mean, I might have like, you know, if you have a couple houses closed in a month, that's an enormous amount of money that goes back to you. And if you buy a couple, then that's an enormous amount of money that goes out. So I tend to like the ability to borrow against paid off assets. And when money comes in, I can pay debt off. And when I need the money back, I can just suck it right back out instead of have a bunch of sitting debt against rentals and then a bunch of sitting cash because the bank just picks up the spread. So what I found was when I computed my real effective interest rate at the end of the year, like just to make math simple, let's just say I'm paying the bank five and they're paying me one. So there's like a 4% spread right there. What I found was that when I'm swinging money in and out, my effective interest rate was like less than two and a half percent. So I was paying almost half, even though my rate was higher, because a lot of times I wasn't, if I had any money, I could pay all the debt all the way down as far as I could. So, so that was by far my favorite way. That, that is, that's how I finance everything. I mean, I'll, I'll get a bunch of money by, let's say I flip a bunch of houses that buys me, gives me enough cash to go buy a rental, buy the rental cashed out, take a line of credit against it. Now I effectively have access to all that liquidity if I ever need it. And I'm not paying any payments on it, which makes my monthly cash flow really good. Okay. So let me get this straight. How many years into flipping from, from starting at 19, did you realize that this model was best for you? So I, I want to give credit to someone else for it. It was, I was probably, so at 19, I got into this promised myself I'd go back to college, which I rank as one of my top mistakes. Got a degree in teaching and some other things. So for a while I was making, you know, for a year I made like 22,000 as a teacher and then 
ramped flipping back up probably age 26. So from 26 to 31, it took about five years to retire. With some good mentorship and extraordinary amount of hard work and some luck, a lot of people can retire or get really close to it in five years. I think seven is, is pretty easy conservative. I think 10 borders on. Not a no-brainer because that's not fair to say, but very, very doable. I, I love this quote. I forget who said it. You might know who said it, but we overestimate what we can do in a year, but we underestimate what we can do in five years. So the fact that you, you flipped a couple houses at 19, you sort of built that skill set. Then you went back to college, became a teacher, realized, you know, what the heck am I doing? I'm trading time for money again. Well, and I, I wanted to do something that I was like really passionate about and really help people. And, and at that age, I thought teaching would be that thing. And what I didn't realize was the thing that made me happy was, you know, business and going after financial freedom. And that was just a lesson I, I had to learn. But you asked about the rental side. And I think that's a really good question. So I started out just flipping, flipping, flipping. Eventually I got, you know, a rental, but I, I really had a turning moment where I'm at the auction block and an, an old timer uh, pulled me aside uh, named Glenn. And he's like, you know, how come you don't just get rentals? And <laughs> I was like, why should, no, why should I? You know, say I, you know, I'm just going to make easy numbers, but say you make 10,000 a year on a rental and I can make 30,000 on a flip. That's like three years. I mean, you have to deal with all the crap and I don't, you know, I'm in and out. And he's like, yeah, but then you got to keep doing it forever. And I was like, hmm. That's what, you know, because people, you like, people are like, yeah, I mean, it's a well paid, it's a really, in my opinion, almost overpaid job, if I'm honest. Um, I think flippers are really overpaid for what they do which is the goal, right? I want the most money for the least work. And really, he kind of got me thinking. He's like, you know, if you get five paid off houses, six paid off houses, you know, you can be bringing in 70K net. For a lot of people, if you have no debt, you can retire or get, you can live a really good lifestyle and be mostly retired with 70, with 70K. And, and so that like really resonated. He's like, yeah, he's right. Five or six houses is really doable. So that's what I did. I, I just kind of started that model of buy a house, pay it off. Uh, I took it to flip level. I'll, I'll offer that kind of for your listeners is a lot of people are like, oh, it's a rental. So people are going to trash it. So I'm not going to put any money into it or minimal money. And one of my other mentors was just a beast with rentals. And she would take her rentals to like flip level and then she would rent them. And what would happen is she would get top quality renters, top quality renters, uh, are the ones that make you take your shoes off when you go to visit your own house. Top quality owners are the ones that like, they don't stay for a year. They tend to stay for like two and a half, three plus years. So your, your turnover is so much lower. Your repair costs are so much lower. Your real net is so much higher. And the thing that nobody ever talks about is the amount of energy you have to spend. Because everybody focuses on their spreadsheets, right? But if you focus not just on like ROI, but like ROE, like how much energy do I have to spend to get that passive money? All of a sudden it was like, this is the play. So, so I started just buying houses and then that turned out to be, you know, just amazing. I mean, that was addictive. I was like, oh yeah, this passive income thing is amazing. You know, so all of a sudden I get five and I'm like, oh, I need 10. You get 10, you need 15. In fact, we had, I think 18 this year and I started, you know, the market was just so strong. I just liquidated some of the ones that I thought were a little more marginal. But that's pretty much, I mean, I went from like, oh, my goal is to be a millionaire to like, who cares about that goal? Uh, I would really say that to your listeners too. No one cares. You won't care, honestly, when you get there. What you will care about is, do you have passive income? Cash flow. It's all about cash flow. Yep. Yep. It's funny. I don't know if you saw on my Facebook, I was prospecting some for sale by owner, like small apartment buildings in Virginia Beach, where I'm from, to try to build out some... Uh, like Airbnb boutique hotels. Mm. And this guy, I'm chatting with him and, and I, I could tell immediately that he was kind of crazy. <laughs> and I kept asking him about the NOI on the building. It's a six oh, unit. Yeah, I did see this. Yeah. He kept, he kept telling me, who cares about NOI? It's all about appreciation, baby. If you want to invest in a business, go buy a McDonald's. If you want to invest in real estate, I'm your guy. And I said, what's, what's more important than cash flow? And he said, Real estate's an appreciation game, man, not a cash flow game. And so I asked him some more questions and found out that he had been losing money on his portfolio for 20 years and now he's liquidating. <laughs> so poor guy. Jeez. 
back to um, one thing that you've told me, Jared, that I thought was something that stuck with me from one of our conversations. And I think you kind of know how I am now. I, I make these mental notes and, and I just like obsess over them. One thing you had said was you're different than most other flippers that buy uh, and, and have rentals. Most flippers keep low margin deals that they're going to lose money on when they flip as their rentals because it's a plan B. You keep your high margin deals as your rentals and you flip everything else. Take me through a little bit about why you made that decision and maybe when you made that decision and sort of how that's worked out for you. So what I found with other flippers I would talk to is they're like, yeah, I bought this property. We got in. Basically, it was a bad play. And instead of like flipping it and either taking a small profit or a small loss, they're like, well, I'll just turn it into a rental. And so what they effectively do is tie up credit, tie up, tie up capital. And now they've basically got this shitty property that they're going to rent in the hopes that in four or five, you know, in five years, yeah, it's going to make some money, but it will, it will then look good in five years. And that always just seemed the most bass backwards approach ever. Like, what, so well, anyway, the way that I processed it is, and especially if my goal was paid off rentals. So, I mean, again, back to kind of what my mentor said, he's like, you know, you five houses, if you can make your goal five paid off houses, you can be done. And, and that just really resonated. So if that's your goal is five or six paid off houses, then if you can buy the house for like, say half price, then you can get to your goal twice as fast. And then it's all in the subtle details. Not only do you get to your goal twice as fast, but let's say the market, you know, you, you want to be conservative and, and safe. If the market corrects and tanks a whole bunch, say, say you buy your property close to market, you know, you got a little bit of margin in there. If the market goes down 10% and you only have 10% equity, you're zero. Your net worth just went to zero. Versus if you buy for half off, the market goes down 10%. You don't care at all. Market goes down 50%, you're still break even. So, so I liked, I'm a pretty conservative person in terms of like, I, I want my, you know, decisions to be very long term. And I always felt like buying half off, let me buy them, basically let me hit my goal twice as fast and made the investments twice as safe. One of the, one of the pieces of that is that I see people rush, like, oh, I got to get a rental like now. And I'm like, if you run a spreadsheet, like if you can buy a house 20% off, depending on interest rates and some other things, like that puts you ahead like 12 point some years on a 30 year mortgage. So it's a, it's a short game mentality. Like, oh, I want to get a rental so I get started right away. And I'm like, bro, make it your focus to get the thing 20% off or more because that launches you so much further ahead on getting it paid off. Got it. Okay. I want to I want to come right back to that. I have one question I want to ask before I forget it because I didn't write it down and it just popped in my head. Why do you focus on single family? You told me you have, you have one fourplex too or small multifamily. Why do you focus on that rather than commercial apartment buildings? So, super good question. I, I think there's really comes down to kind of area of expertise. I got into flipping. Flipping was single family residents. I think if I would have got into flipping apartments, which I know some people do, I probably would do apartments. So when I started out at 19, the skill set, the team, the systems I honed were all around like basically single family resident acquisition. So so it, it played to what I was what I was doing. Rather than shiny object syndrome, you stayed in what you knew, you became a master at that and you focused on that and it worked out for you. Okay. So Let's get back to, to what we were just talking about. You talked about don't rush into a rental. If you can get it at 20% off, it, it shortens your time frame on that 30-year mortgage so much more. Are you talking about market cycles? Or are you talking about just buying a home at distress uh, and getting a discount that way? So I, I would say that when the market tanks, you know, and if you train yourself to buy houses at discount, when the market tanks, you are then super well prepared to take care of take advantage of opportunities. Because what what the money is really in the properties that no one else is competing with you for. Right? I mean, the problem is you go to auction, you compete with a bunch of people. You go on the MLS, you're competing with a bunch of people. You want to be the person that you know finds a niche or finds niches where you have just really minimal 
levels of competition. And that skill set is really worth developing and training because it'll work in any cycle and it really kills it in a down cycle. And that's something I really admire you. You have crushed it on market timing. And I, I want to chat about that. Let's first answer me this. How do you find those deals at a 20% discount? What are you doing now or what's worked for you in the past? What sort of niches have you gone through to find those discount deals? Right. So I've, you know, networking, I think is useful. If people know that you do this, that's useful. Um, cause you'll, you'll occasionally have somebody like give you a, you know, hand you a deal that makes sense. It, you know, when I started out, I was a, you know, obviously a really small fish. And so I basically did the kind of like in the trench work that the people that were really successful didn't want to do. And if I'm honest, you know, at some point, like if I'm making way more money than I can spend, I don't need to go out and knock on doors and do that kind of stuff. Right. And maybe I'm just getting lazy. So now there's like hanging fruit for the next person that wants to do that level of hustle. So a lot of that when I started was talking to people just face to face. And I didn't have a script. Um, I had the one guy when I knocked on his door, I was I just started talking to him. I was in sweats. I mean, I came from the gym. Uh, I didn't, you know, I just looked like <laughs> a mess. And he's like, he's like, you know, and he was he was getting ready to move out. He was done. And he's like, well, what was your plan? And I kind of looked at it and was like, hmm, I didn't really have a plan. And he, he just kind of, I mean, it was just real honesty. It was, and it kind of disarmed And he's like, well, why don't you come in? And we just ended up negotiating me buying it from him, got him out of it. He got him some extra money. I made good money on it. I think there's, I think people underestimate the value of like sincerity, authenticity. And I mean, you don't have to have some like scripted salesperson plan. Like if anything, when people are in that, that vulnerable state, there's a lot to be said for just being as transparent and honest as you can. People feel safer in that space was my experience. I love that. And what kind of homes were you going after for door knocking? Like what list were they on? Were they pre-foreclosure, tax delinquents, absentee, just distress driving for dollars? Pre-foreclosure kind of stuff. Um, I found that the tax sales, at least in the area that I'm in, I mean, you'd start with a list of a gazillion homes. And by the, you, by the time you went down to the block and did all the work, it was just a horrible return on my energy. Okay. And if for anybody that's listening, Jared keeps mentioning block. If you don't know what that is, he's talking about tax or, or foreclosure auctions. So my next question is, how do you fund the deals? And what I want to get into is we know how you fund the deals now. You use your rentals, you use the equity in your rentals with lines of credit. But when you were first getting started, how were you funding the deals, whether it was at auction or these door knocked homes? What were you doing to get to get funding? I mean, one of the deals I did, in fact, the one I was just telling you about, I mean, the guy basically said, you know, take over payments, right? And so, I mean, I got a quick claim deed. I basically owned the house, took his little mortgage payment thing and, and made some payments. Now, obviously, they have due on sale clauses, right? And, you know, my experience was the bank wasn't going to get wasn't going to foreclose on the house in the 90 days it was going to take me to fix it and sell it. And the truth is, if they keep getting their money, they have a lot of other non-paying people that they're more worried about than you. So, so that allowed me, again, young, don't have almost any money to take the little bit I did and like turn a small amount of money into a very large amount of money um, and just keep rinse and repeat that cycle. So that was kind of how I took, you know, the little savings I had, you know, and then turned that into a, a big payoff, took that large amount of that money, took it into another big payoff and just multiplied it a couple of times. And then at some point, then you have enough money that if you go back to the, uh, the rental acquisition, then you buy a rental and now you can line a credit your, your way back. So now you have access to the money. So it's kind of a rinse and repeat of that cycle. So people, my experience is people tend to uh, also look at partnering. Um, and I personally, my personality is like, if you can get the hard money loan and do it yourself, I recommend it, you know, profit split. If you need to learn, use that as a, as a learning mechanism, but, you know, giving away half of your money is a lot of money to give away. And, you know, you should do that, you know, for a limited time, but really try to get access to hard money loans or bank loans as fast as you can. And the least expensive way that I found to access capital without reoccurring huge fees and reasonable interest rates was the line of credit stuff I'm telling you about. 
Gotcha. I like that. Yeah. You gave me some good tips. And since then I've pulled out a couple lines of credits for rehab and, and any other projects that I'm working on. So I appreciate you for that. I really like how you um, took a small amount of money, parlayed it into a, a larger sum, weren't a, a young 20s idiot who blew it all, but you took that money, parlayed it into even more, into even more, into even more, then bought a rental, then parlayed the equity in that into even more. You've been really smart about it, uh, which I really admire. You weren't one of those kids that had a huge trust fund or somebody that got a huge loan from the dad. You worked your ass off, at, at least it sounds like, and, and knowing you, I, I believe that, and were smart with it, which is really cool and something that I don't think a lot of people talk about. And so not a whole lot of people realize it's not easy, but if it was easy, everybody would do it. Tim Ferriss has like an analogy I read in, I think for our work week where he says, like, it's like fishing in a pond where you have to hike up some mountain to get to some like really remote spot. And, but once you're there, once you make the climb, the place is just stalked. And, and he's like, or you can be down there where it's easy to climb to, but the irony is it's harder to fish there because everyone's there. And that like resonates with what you're saying to me, because it's true. The climb up there is, is hard and more difficult, but once you're, once you make that climb and make that investment, really what it does is it filters out all the people that don't really want it. So in a weird way, it's hard up front and easy on the back end. So focus on business models or areas where the barrier to entry might be much harder, but once you found that niche, it's a lot easier to really master that game. Got it. Okay, so you are, and myself, and, and our, our mutual friend, how we met, Ben, we're all like total systems nerds. So I want to ask you, how do you manage the deals and your business now that you have it very systematized, you have a lot of delegation in place? What are some of the things that, that you've done to sort of remove yourself and be more of the entrepreneur rather than the technician or the manager? And I really think you like hit the crux of that when you talked about kind of being the owner operator versus the technician, because, uh, you know, they, they always say the last thing you need to know when you open a restaurant is how to cook the food. The most important part is, you know, understanding the business, the marketing, the leases, all the money. And that really comes down to systems, right? I mean, McDonald's doesn't make the, the greatest food, but they sure as hell have some of the most amazing systems in the game. I tend to focus on the things that uh, I hate to do. One of the best things that I figured out was all tasks aren't equal. And I can spend an hour doing something I really enjoy and an hour doing something I hate. And the energetic cost of the thing I hate is like three hours. But the energetic cost of the thing I love is like next to nothing. So I would find the areas where I'm like, that's a really, or things that I would say are low value. So what are, what's the thing where you're like, oh, that's important, but I could, I could hire someone for like 15 bucks an hour to do that or 20 bucks an hour. And I, I kind of just started. I mean, honestly, bookkeeping was like the first thing that every entrepreneur is like, I've never heard an entrepreneur being like, bookkeeping is just my favorite part of this game. And so delegating that and just systemizing all of the books, all the payments. I mean, I don't get my own mail. Like I don't write the check. I mean, it's, I show up and the bookkeeper can spend two minutes with me and we're done. And uh, we've been set up. So when I'm traveling, like, I have a family member that can sign for me. So I've, I've gone, you know, you know, long periods of time without even seeing that those kind of systems because they're so automated. From there, I kind of took pieces of the flip game. And it was like, um, so right now, it's like the driving of the properties is automated. I don't go to the auctions. Until very recently, I had somebody who I trained to do the analysis. You, you can kind of do it in steps is really what I recommend. I mean, you either have to hire someone who is you, which is surprisingly hard to do, or you got to hire somebody who's like, I like to do a niche. I like to do the construction. So you hire a construction guy. I like to talk to people. So then maybe you have somebody who goes and knocks on doors for you. I like to manage the books. There's that person. So I tend to find that the entrepreneur operator can do all things pretty good. And the smartest thing they can do is develop the system that they hand to somebody and say, this is what I want you to do. And because of their personality type, they're the, guy, they're the person that doesn't want to do all the crap you do. They want to show up each day and do their task, do it really well, and go home. So I kind of took the whole business and segmented it and then tried to find people that match those segments. The part of the resistance I see to people delegating is they're just like, oh, I don't. There's a leap where you're like, oh, I don't want to hire someone for 40 hours a week. 
no joke. You know, a lot of the people that um, I hire, I'll tend, you know, I'll hire as a contractor. I'll be like, hey, I need you to drive this property sometime in, in this period of time. So they have full control over what they're doing. There's a lot of people that really want flexibility and that they don't want to, they don't want to work 40 hours a week either. And I honestly, you know, I mean, there, there isn't 40 hours worth of work for their particular task or set of tasks. So I have found a lot of success in hiring those little niches that I pick at con, you know, just hiring those contractors for fixed amounts. And um, that tends to make them super happy and tends to give me what I want for low commitment. People tend to see hiring it like I'm going to hire an employee and then they're like married to that person for life. And I see a lot of people resist it, but I'm like, hey, what if you just tried it as a contractor? And if it's not working for the one of you, no stress. And then if you start needing more hours, you can just add them. And if you have a week where it's light, you know, you're not, you're not with a fixed cost. So that works really well for me emotionally getting over the hurdle of, of like adding people. I love that. That's something that I realized too. I had a full-time salaried employee and I was always just putting so much pressure on myself to make sure I was maximizing their hours. And now I'm doing everything, you know, 1099 independent contractor, and it's, it's just working so much better. One sort of process that I've found that works really well to systematize is just take a sheet of paper, make three columns, and the columns are things I hate to do that I'm not good at, things I hate to do that I'm good at, and things I love to do that I'm good at, and fill in those three columns and starting on the left, the hate to do and not good at, those are the first things you start to delegate. Yeah. I think that's a more elegant way to say what I was trying to say earlier. Yeah. I love how you said the uh, operator, the entrepreneur, the visionary, as I like to call. One thing that I used to get so hung up on and now I see happen all the time to entrepreneurs is they want to delegate something that they don't know how to do. And I'm a huge proponent of learn how to do it yourself systematize it yourself, then delegate it because then you'll know if the other person's actually doing it good or not. And it's okay if they do it better than you. In fact, you should hire people like what you call a uh, niche task, people that do it better than you, but you got to know how to do it yourself first or else the person that you've hired is going to see that you don't understand it and they're going to lose a lot of respect for you. That over arc of everything you just said, it's not just the respect too. they can start to take advantage of it. Because if you don't know what A game work is and C game work is, people, if there's literally no accountability, that doesn't work. So yeah, I mean, the first house I did, I pulled up a bucket and watched the guy do everything. The second house I did, I basically paid him to do everything and then helped him. And then the third house I did, I did, bought all the tools, did all the stuff myself. So I would know how to do it. I then sold all my tools and hired it out for the rest of my life. But that was a really key point because, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I had a hole in my roof in the uh, house in the river and the you know, drywall guy shows up and he sees the house and sees this you know, young kid and he, he bids a number that's just out, you know, it's, it's obviously outrageous. And, and so I look at him and I was just like, hey, you know, how, you know, you're good at what you do, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So how quick do you think you're gonna have that done? And he's like, oh, you know, and I know how long it's going to take. You know, it should take him about two and a half hours. And he ends up making, try to make like 250 to 300 bucks an hour. And so I was like, either you're really, really slow or you're drastically overcharging me. Like, which one is it? And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, oh, yeah, yeah, that amount's probably a little high. But people, if you're not competent in the thing you're trying to delegate, you'll find that it's really hard to have good, efficient, tight systems. So 100% what you said. I, I really believe I can do all the accounting. I just don't like doing it. But I have all the knowledge of that sub niche. And my bookkeeper is much better at it than me. That's exactly what I want. I see, I see people fail. I really appreciate you bringing this point up. I see people fail because they try to delegate something they literally don't understand. And then they're frustrated because delegation doesn't work. No, delegation is brilliant. They just don't know how to delegate. In fact, they weren't responsible. They were lazy. Does that make a difference? You just described responsible. I understand it. I own it. I'm in charge of it. 
I built the system that, that I'm hiring you to run radically different from, I have no idea about anything. I, how do you pick a good person when you don't even know how to do the task? And then they get a crappy person because they don't know what they're doing. The person then doesn't have any expectations or any real accountability. It bombs, you know, it's a horrible experience. And that's just the difference. And I've, I've made that mistake before too. So let's just be really clear. Like I also know that from experience, there are certain areas I've delegated where I delegated too quickly. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm just such a good delegator. It was that I was lazy in that moment and I paid for it. So yeah, I really recommend understand the task, really know how to do it because that's how you get the insight to build a good system. And I super recommend if you're listening right now, as long as you're not driving or anything like that, like rewind that section that we've been talking about delegation and task management because we, we've done several shows on Life Worth Chasing so far, but that is a, a super valuable segment of the show. So thanks for that, Jared. You sort of segued me into my next question, talking about mistakes. And I love asking this question, especially with really high level investors or entrepreneurs like you. What is, uh, whether it might be something you never shared or the number one mistake that you've made that you learned from, that, you know, whatever's like popping up to your head right now that you could share with our listeners and myself so that we could learn from it? So the first time I lost money, uh, I've lost money on two houses out of all the houses I've flipped. So I mean, we're better than 99%. But that first house I lost money on, I, I remember at some point, if you flip long enough, you're, you're likely to lose money on, on a house the emotional hit that that was, it literally felt like somebody physically hit me. Uh, I think I lost like 20,000, 22,000. And I mean, at that stage, I'm driving like a $3,000 car. So it feels like just an enormous amount of money to me. And the smartest thing I did, I remember I just wanted to like curl up in a ball, go to a corner of a room and lick my wounds for six months. Like I literally had that visceral reaction. And I just need to protect myself. And instead, I leaned into that pain. And I was like, no, F that. Like, I'm going to go out. I'm going to get another house as fast as I can. I'm going to pay that back. And I'm going to keep going. I ended up buying a house in, in, from cash to cash. Like, I bought it. And I sold it and got the check. In 13 days, I did a house that made like 18 grand. So it recovered almost all of that money right away. And that emotional shift. People always tend to focus on the numbers in real estate. And in my experience, there's a, as you move up in, in kind of the game, it becomes a lot more about emotion, right? What I just described was, was, you know, the numbers were easy, but it was the emotion that was hard. So, you know, obviously a big mistake was that that first house I lost money on. And I learned a lot about like, you know, what niches didn't sell well, you know, and that was a house I, I misjudged badly, honestly. And what I learned out of that was when you experience that kind of pain, instead of constricting, just lean into it. Lean into it and how fast can you recoup it? I've had other friends that have lost money in real estate. And that's the advice I always give them. They've always come back and been like, that was the on point advice. They're like really hurt. There was a lot of pain involved in losing money. You have to admit that you were really wrong. Instead, of withdrawing from the thing that just caused you pain, which is very human reaction, to just charge in the same direction, get you out of the hole, get you back into the cycle faster of making money. So yeah, I mean, the biggest thing was, you know, like misjudging a house. The counter to that was not letting me, not letting that stop me. Got it. Thanks for sharing that. And just really curious, I, I, I don't think I could move forward without asking, how did you misjudge the house? What was it about it that you lost money? So a couple of things happened. That was in the area that I'm in, two car garages are a really big deal. So this is the first house I bought, one of the one of the first houses I bought that didn't have a two car garage. And you know, again, this is earlier on in my career. You know, I've probably done, I don't know how many houses. Twenty. I mean, I've done enough that like I can take that loss. You know, say say I'm, I'm literally making up a number. Say I've done 30, 40 houses. And what happened is, and even the appraiser when he when he appraised the house, he called me up and he's like how are you so far below market? Like this house is worth more. And I was like, it is. And we both know it. But when people do searches, like say you tell your realtor, like, hey, I want a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. It, my house, even it wasn't showing up. So, and this is back when obviously there was more inventory on the market than there is right now. But 
people just never even saw my house because as you, the way you put in search criteria meant that it never showed. And that was a big lesson for me was like really understanding, like, where's the sweet spot? Because if it's a deal, but no one sees it, it will be a lot less valuable. And the two car garage piece at that stage was a big deal. Now the market's so strong, it's way less relevant. At that moment, it was a big deal. We were talking about like, you know, where do you find the houses? And um, one of the other things, because I've, I've explored Austin, San Diego, Vegas, Seattle, I've explored like bigger markets. And I keep coming back to, um, I started buying in smaller markets in Washington. And I found personally that there's a lot less competition in smaller markets. I mean, you show up in Phoenix and I mean, they just have hedge funds. I mean, it, it's hard to compete with hedge funds that are like, yeah, I mean, that's a little under market. Yeah, but it's so little under market, you couldn't flip it and make any money. Yeah, but they've got to deploy, you know, how many millions of dollars this week, right? So you get into these smaller markets where the, that competition is like, ah, it's not worth it. There's not enough, you know, there's just not enough turnover for us. I've found other flippers that have made really, the ones that I found that make the most money often play in, have found niches. Yeah, man. I, I think that it comes back to, are you trying to play a big game in a small pond or play a, a, a small game in a big pond? And I agree, man. The the people that have huge companies with a lot of money to deploy, San Diego, Phoenix, Vegas, sure, it works. But for the most part, if you're trying to be a, a solopreneur, have a lot of flexibility, have some independent contractors and just build some financial wealth for yourself, smaller market is the way to go. Okay. So we've been chatting for almost an hour now. I know both of us have a hard stop coming here soon, but um, I, I made a post uh, as I do with most of the episodes. They're not fan questions or anything, but they're more like uh, social media questions. So I'm going to fire through those and let's just, you know, in like one or two sentences each, let's just try to get them answered. So Jessica asks, how much capital did you start with and where did you get funding from? So when I first started, um, I, I had saved up about $10,000 and, you know, $10,000 doesn't buy, doesn't buy you a house. The first uh, thing I did was, you know, got an investor and basically said, you know, Hey, you put up half. I find, I fix, I flip, you get the other half. And, and again, that's, that's how I think a lot of people, if they don't know what they're doing, that's where you start. As rapidly as I could, I worked on getting to the spot where like, oh, I could be more creative, right? Like uh, the example I gave you where like, you know, I took over payments for a little bit. I did everything I could to like not involve a partner because that's how you get away half the money. But yeah, I mean, it, it, at the beginning, you're either hard money or you're partnering. Got it. Okay. Dylan asks, what do you look for when purchasing to hold? Like when you're buying a rental, what do you look for? Great question. Uh, I look for a house that I would be comfortable living in because the demographics uh, fit a type of person that, that will stay longer. Uh, I look for something that is discounted at least 20%, ideally closer to 40 or 50%. And then I try to get it to, like I said, a flip level. So I end up then attracting again, another renter that will stay forever and has very high ROE. Got it. Love it. Jordan said, assuming, all right. He, he gave like a situation here. Assuming it's rented out and cash flowing, how and when do you decide to sell it? I, I said I sold some of my stuff. I sold the stuff that I was like, hey, that property for whatever reason isn't performing. I have a formula in my spreadsheet that predicts what a property should, should make. And if it, does, you know, if it does what it's supposed to, it says 100%. And some properties I'll see that like, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to hit the numbers. I had a six plex and it just didn't, it should have been a money maker. And the truth is the turnover and the demographics, it just created a lot of issues where it wasn't making money like I thought it should. And so I just got that money back. So I, I tend to sell properties that are underperforming. And for the most part, especially if you buy a property like half off and that thing's, oh, let me add that. The other nice thing about buying a property half off is your cash on cash return is epic. So not only are you much safer, but you know, you, if you buy a house for 80 grand instead of 160, you know, or 100,000 instead of 200,000, you just doubled what you're making. And when 
When you say these 20 and 50% discounts, are you talking about purchase price related to the after repair value? Yeah, I'm talking about after I buy it and, and repair it, what's that percentage relative to what I can sell it for? So, so uh, yeah, I tend to just add to that. I tend to then not sell the ones that I buy super cheap because the capital gains will be so high. I just, I, I haven't sold those. I'm mean, going to do the analysis of like market correcting. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Ryan asked, if you were starting over today, how would you start? Probably the exact same way, honestly. Find someone who I can borrow money from. I would literally be the person that was going door to door, going after niches that no one else is going after. I explored a lot of niches when I started. I mean, there's a lot of ways to find properties. And you know, I don't tend to see myself as maybe the smartest person, but I often see myself as the hardest working person. And you shake enough trees that other people are just too lazy to shake you will find some niches. Love it. So niche down and focus on where the competition is not at. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey asks, where did you save the money to acquire your first three properties and how much of those three purchases did you finance? The first three were all partnered and that was it. So really my money didn't, I mean, I had, I had some money at that stage, but because I was set up to partner, um, I didn't put any of my own money in it. That was kind of part of our deal. I mean, that works. I think knowing what I know now, I would probably, hard money wasn't as available. You know, I was a 19 year old. I didn't really understand hard money. So I would, I would tend to focus on, you know, how, how can you build up flips as fast as you can so you don't have to have a partner. Got it. Perfect. Matthew asks, what is the best way to get your first rental? Personal opinion that worked for me was lots of patience. Cherry pick the best deal that you get. I mean, say, say you're, don't try to make it like, Hey, I'm trying to get a rental, I'm trying to get like five rentals this year. Uh, that's an approach, but I tend to be like, Hey, I want to get one rental in the next two years. So then I will cherry pick the best deal and, you know, multiply that across some, some, some time. Once you get good at that, once you find the niche, like we were talking about, then it's not like one every two years, all of a sudden, you know, you can add multiple rentals in a year, but I tend to make the criteria. I want a really good deal. So maybe the goal should be not so much on the outcome, but more on the process of finding good deals rather than actually buying uh, your first rental. Right. I see people that are like, I want a rental and that's, that's their criteria. And I tend to say, I want a property half off or 35% off, then I'm going to hold it as a rental. But I invert their, their focus on get a rental tends to neglect, you know, what they're paying for it, what the, per it tends to not focus on, I think the things that make a good rental. Right. Okay. Gene asks, what is something you wish somebody told you before you invested in your first property? That the focus is on cash flow. That, and my mentor honestly told me this. I just didn't take the advice. She said, the number one mistake I made was that I flipped my first house instead of held it. And, you know, you can make all that money. It's, it's addictive to not, I mean, yeah, I want that cash. Um, but when I bought that first house I told you about for 40 grand, it would have been really easy to pay that thing off. And I would have had a rental much faster than I did. So, and I would add to that, I know a lot of people when they get into this game, they want to be a millionaire. And I would say that you can be a millionaire and still have to go to work every day. Focus on, I, I tend to like the game of financial freedom. How quick can you not have to work? I like that. Daniel asked, <clears throat> what is your favorite strategy to find flip opportunities? I mean, I think we've covered that a couple of different ways. Uh, to me, it feels like, I mean, right now it's, it's auction and it's going to be, I mean, that's drying up pretty hard. So it's going to be more, you know, going direct to people. And, and I think, again, if I was starting, it would be exploring. There's a lot of niches. I mean, it's relationships with realtors. Um, I know some people that do probate. I know some people, there's like a variety of ways to define, to find properties where people are just like, you know, I'm not trying to maximize value as much as I'm trying to maximize convenience. And I don't want to fix the property up perfect to maximize resale value. You, you know, people that just want to move on from properties. There's a, a book, I'll talk to you about it afterwards that I, I'll recommend. Okay, cool. All right. So this next guy has like three questions. I don't know who he thinks he is, but his name is Chase. He's in San Diego. He wants to, he, he's got three questions. What a guy. What do you think are the future of flipping? What do you think are the trends? for future of flip? And where would your focus be now if you were not financially free and you were you know, completely full-time? I think that a lot of the, the market's just super, super hot right now. 
I think that it's harder to get great price rentals currently. If it were me, I would tend to flip, build up a capital base. I know a lot of smart people that are kind of just making sure that they kind of have their house in order. Um, and we're on one of the longest bull markets time-wise in, in, I think, history. I'm not saying it's going to correct tomorrow, but I am saying that like at the end of every cycle, people are surprised when it happens. And I would tend to get my financial house in order. I would tend to make sure I had a lot of dry capital because if things do, if the markets do shift, if any interest rates change, what you'll see is all the marginal players get squeezed really fast. All those flippers that were like banking on appreciation, banking on the market going up 20%, which is why they were making any money in the first place. All of those people will get vaporized rapidly. You know, it'd be like just an X man, just they're gone. The people that then really mint money are the ones that have access to capital at that stage. I would, I would tend to be focused on the flips. If you find a good rental opportunity, which are getting harder and harder to find, you know, pounce on it, but don't force it. Yeah. Keep, keep the longer horizon. You know, not just like six months of I need a rental. It's like, you know, what could I do in two years and build build a bunch of dry powder in the meantime? Like it. I like that a lot. So for me, I've been focusing mainly on wholesaling. So I don't even get stuck with a, a flip here in San Diego if, if something were to happen because margins are like eight to 10%. And rather, if I find my, my philosophy right now is if I do find a good burr opportunity where I can refi with 25% equity and it cash flows, then why not? Because even if the market takes a hit, it's cash flowing and you know I got good equity in the property. Okay. So Chase's next question is, how would you suggest attacking a smaller market while living in a bigger market? That really comes down to a lot of systems, right? How, how far away are you from that market? If you can give me some sense. You know, like, I mean, it's very different if you're like a whole state away or if you're like, hey, I'm an hour or two away, so I could get there. But I mean, I can't make that commute every day. Yeah, I think I'm a whole state away, man, to be honest, because I've been there, there's not really any small markets out here in SoCal. To me, the big part is like, I mean, you can pay somebody that's going to take pictures of the property, which is what I do. And I have a system for that. And ironically, I think they do a better job than I do now because they have to follow the system and I get lazy. So if you can, you develop the system where here's the properties, you have somebody go out and look at it. You obviously need a way to assess value, right? And so if you can see it, you can predict what you think repairs are going to be, which I think is you know, not too hard once you systemize what you're trying to do with the house. Then, you, then it really comes down to the repair part's easy. You can be plus or minus on repairs a couple grand, no big deal. You really want to be accurate on comp value. So the real question is, how are you going to be accurate with determining what it's actually going to sell for? Because the rest is like a very basic spreadsheet. Cool. And we already answered my last question about where we're at in the market cycle. So I appreciate that. Okay, cool. So let's start wrapping up here. Do you have any resources or people you follow or guides or books that you recommend? Yeah, there's, so one of those books was how to buy property 20% below market. Um, I can kick you that link. E-Myth, money, four hour work week, super solid. I've got some, just some blog posts. If you go to jaredfielding.com and click on the financial, there's stuff where I talk about kind of passive investing, debt, analyzing risks, things that millionaires have told me. They're, they're pretty short articles. They're very condensed, but I think they kind of paint a really good picture that almost everyone I know that's been successful like has said, yeah, that, that super resonates. Awesome. Love it, man. Uh, and we'll put the links to those books, the links to Jared's blog posts all in the show notes. So if you're listening and you're like, man, I want to read what Jared's reading, I want to read his blogs, just scroll down into the show notes. And then last two things, Jared, what's the number one actionable tip that you would give the listeners that are checking out this episode? It would probably be to, to like live, live beneath your means. I mean, I, I was actually looking for a way to segue into this. It's the, the mistake I see people make is they start making a lot of money. You know, they flip a house and all of a sudden you got like poof, all this capital. And, and you caught it earlier. You kind of said it. I didn't go out and buy the $60,000 car when I clearly could have. I didn't go out and ball up really hard. I took all that money and just kept living really frugal. I had a great lifestyle, but you know, everything I have at a discount. I mean, I got a Tesla for 30% off. So I still like to have nice things. I just buy them at discounts. And so I would say condition yourself to get everything, car, clothing, house at a discount. Makes it a lot easier to retire because the threshold's lower. And your ability to save and compound money is so much better when you 
basically teach yourself. Most of the millionaires I know were frugal. So that millionaire next door concept is very, very accurate in my experience. Got it. Love it. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the living beneath your means philosophy. I practice it every single day. And as my income grows, I, I like my income to grow 5X before my expenses grow 1X. So that's that I live by. Jared, what's the best place for uh, somebody to follow you, get in touch with you, uh, see what you're up to? Facebook is good. It's, I think facebook.com. I think it's like Jared Fielding one. Uh, Instagram, it's just Jared Fielding. Twitter, it's Jared Fielding. Yeah, all those work. Awesome. And we'll put the links to that in the show notes as well. Jared, I really appreciate your time. I am 100% positive we're going to get a ton of people that want you back on the show. So maybe we can uh, have another chat later this year or early next year. I really appreciate you, man. And uh, have a good one. You too. Have a good one, Chase. Thanks for listening to Life Worth Chasing with me, your host, Chase Maher. If you like the show, smash that subscribe button. Leave me a rate and review. You know what? Screenshot the show, share it on Instagram, tag me at I am Chase Maher, and I'll repost it. There's hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you've made the decision to listen to mine, which is so cool. I'll see you on the next show.